اه شيرين ازيك ان شاء الله تكوني بخير ربنا يخليكي يا استاذه فانا الله ينورنا الله يخليك عامله ايه كده ربنا يخليك اهلا وسهلا الف مبروك على المؤتمر الجميل ده ويا رب دايما بالتوفيق والنجاح كده و... وميرسي على الدعوه الله يخليك ان شاء الله دايما يعني تبقي معانا على طول في المؤتمرات جايه ان شاء الله باذن الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله دكتور ابراهيم ازي حضرتك دكتوره شيرين ازي حضرتك الحمد لله تمام الحمد لله ابتدي ان شاء الله المفروض في خلال دقائق بس احنا مستنيين من المودريتور هاله هي فاتحه المايك بس مش قادره تفتح الكاميرا هاله لو انا اقفل المايك بقى والفيديو دلوقتي لما يجي معايا دي صح؟ باذن الله ان شاء الله شيرين ربنا يكرمك ان شاء الله دكتور ابراهيم هيبتدي على طول المحاضره بس نشوف هاله بس الاول هاله يمكن في مشكله عند هاله في في المايك مش عارف هاله انت مش سامعاني ولا ايه طب عموما انا هقول يعني هقدم وبعدين هاله ممكن بعد كده تجوين في نهايه الليكتشر ان شاء الله يعني هو هو احنا اتس اور جريت بليجر هي ان ذس كونفرنس اند ويتش از emerged between our uh, previous society, modern Egyptian society of internists and the new society, which is the Arab African Asian Association for the study of diabetes, hypertension, and lipidology. Uh, to, to introduce this uh, first virtual meeting. Um, and this next lecture, inshallah, next session uh, in diabetes, We will start by the very first lecture by Professor Ibrahim Galad, the professor, the very eminent professor of, of surgery in uh, Qas al Aini in Cairo University, to give us a lecture in the cross talks between medicine and internal medicine and surgery concerning the metabolic surgery. I'm very much enthusiastic to, to uh, learn a lot from Professor Ibrahim and Mujur. Inshallah, Professor Ibrahim, uh, the floor is, for, is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Uh, I'd like to express my cordial thanks to you for this uh, kind invitation. And uh, uh, I'd like to express that uh, uh, I uh, uh, already uh, have the opportunity to attend uh, some congresses about uh, diabetes from the perspective of physicians as well as surgeons. And uh, this meeting is uh, uh, usually held in Europe every two years. Uh, this is a usual uh, routine meeting. The physicians meet the surgeons and they all speak about the mutual management of this uh, problem. Uh, permit me to start uh, my uh, Presentation, uh, uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, metabolic surgery is a term that is used to describe surgical procedures designed to treat different components of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome actually is an still a rather ambiguous problem. The definitions are plenty. However, some of the authorities tried to define this problem like the National Cholesterol Education Program, the World Health Organization, the European Group of the Study of Insulin Resistance, the International Diabetes Foundation, the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, and many of the authorities. However, the essential components of metabolic syndromes constitute a cluster of disorders, mainly composed of visceral obesity, sometimes it is known as central or truncal, and it is expressed as increased waist circumference. The second component is arterial hypertension, which is usually associated with insulin resistance, uh, constituting type 2 diabetes. The third is arterial hypertension, and the third is atherogenic dyslipidemia. However, several components every day are recognized as being 
one of the components of metabolic syndrome, like hepatosteatosis, gallstones, gastroesophageal reflux disease, polycystic ovary syndrome, etc., etc., and others every day are recognized to be part of the problem. The pathogenesis is not yet clear. However, most probably, metabolic syndrome is related to excessive sweet consumption, genetic factors, aging, sedentary life, consumption of alcohol, and other factors. All these factors share the same outcome, which is they produce accumulation of fat in the visceral area. And visceral fat is different from peripheral fat. Visceral fat is an active endocrine organ, and it produces inflammatory mediators which provoke a state of increased insulin resistance and decreased sensitivity, which ultimately will lead to metabolic syndrome. Essentials of diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, we are all know that increase fasting glucose, increase arterial blood pressure, triglycerides, increase with circumference, etc. The treatment modalities uh, are uh, in the form of three main components. This is the classic diet control. And by diet control, we have to limit consumption of calories, calories to below 1,000 calories per day, ideally around 800. This can be done by diet regulation. The second thing is encouragement of physical activity. And uh, we encourage the patient to practice any physical exercise for at least 150 minutes per week. And the third component of treatment is drug therapy. If you observe diet, physical, and drugs necessitate a lot of patient compliance, but this is very difficult. You cannot advise the patient to eat so-and-so, do physical exercise, so-and-so, take several drugs, so-and-so, and you expect that, will be, uh, that he will be consistent, that will, he will be committed to all these instructions easily. It's very difficult. What is the role of surgery in this respect? If there is any added value of surgery for metabolic syndrome, uh, in the 1950s, several reports were published about improvement of type 2 diabetes after gastrointestinal surgery for treating cancer, stomach, and uh, peptic ulcer. Uh, in the 1990s, bariatric surgery was practiced with the intent of achieving weight loss. But the same observation was found, namely improvement of different components of metabolic syndrome, not only diabetes mellitus, but also hypertension, dyslipidemia, hepatosteatosis, and other components. This led to thinking about what is the role of surgery on the gastrointestinal tract to control different components of metabolic syndrome. The main role of surgery is to modify the transit of nutrients through the gastrointestinal tract. This modification of transit will help three changes. Number one, reduction of gastric volume. And this will entail decreased caloric intake. Number two, by passing the small gut, especially the proximal part of the small gut, the duodenal loop, and the proximal part of the jejunum, and this will lead to a state of hypoabsorption, and sometimes it is called malabsorption. 
And the last and very important change is transit modification, food transit modification will ultimately lead to change of the gut hormone pattern. This will lead to resumption of the delicate balance between incretins and the anti-incretins. We know that anti-incretins are present mo mostly in the foregut, and if you bypass the foregut, the stimulation of anti-incretins is much reduced, and they act as anti-insulins, and they share in the insulin resistance problem. A large body of evidence now demonstrates that surgery for type 2 diabetes can achieve up to complete disease remission in nearly three quarters of patients with reasonable durability of around 50% of cases. And also it can prevent, delay, and ameliorate a lot of type 2 diabetes complications. Also, it was found that after bariatric surgery for obese non-diabetic subjects, insulin resistance is completely reversed within the first few months, long before normalization of body weight. Also, it was observed that obese patients usually develop type 2 diabetes more than 40-fold than lean persons. On the other hand, 80% of patients with type 2 diabetes may be overweight or obese. This led to the conclusion that obesity and diabetes are intimately interrelated. In the diabetes prevention program, in overweight and obese insulin resistant individuals. The modest weight loss has been shown to reduce insulin resistance to the extent that if the patient loses only five to six kilograms, he can reduce the incidence of diabetes by around 50 to 60 percent. This is in the pre-diabetics. Thus, weight loss is recommended for all overweight or obese individuals, meaningly with BMI above 25, who have or at risk for diabetes. And this has a level of evidence A in the research. In a Johns Hopkins study, among overweight or obese patients with type 2 diabetes, weight loss of around 7 to 14 percent was typically required for full discontinuation of at least one antidiabetic medication. And to stop insulin, it was found that this can be achieved at a mean weight reduction of around 11% of initial total body weight. Now we recognize that diabetes and obesity are intimately related, and sometimes we call this relation diabetes, the problem of diabetes. What is the result of this? This is the whole background of the rationale of bariatric surgery being considered as metabolic surgery, as bariatric surgery help patients to lose weight and in the same time to improve metabolic syndrome. Let's revise the recommendations of different uh, eminent societies all over the world. I'll start by the American Diabetes Association. This is the report of uh, 
2020, uh, it speaks about the standards of medical care in diabetics. Please revise item number eight, which speaks about the role of surgery. It said that metabolic surgery should be, should be recommended as an option to treat type two diabetes in screened surgical candidates with BMI above 40, who do not achieve durable weight loss and improvement in comorbidities, including, of course, hyperglycemia with non-surgical methods. Level of evidence A. The second recommendation is nearly the same that metabolic surgery may be considered may be considered for patients with BMI above 30. Let's revise uh, these results. If the BMI is above 40, metabolic surgery should be recommended. And if the BMI is above 30, metabolic surgery may be considered. This is the exact words used in the report of ADA. The second institute we will speak about is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, UK, uh, which is known as the NICE, of course. The guideline published in 2015 about bariatric surgery for people with recent onset type 2 diabetes said that you have to offer an expedited, expedited assessment for bariatric surgery to people with BMI of 35 or more who have recent onset type 2 diabetes, as long as they are also receiving or will receive assessment in type 3 service. Also for BMI above 30, you have to consider an assessment for bariatric surgery. Again, this is the same finding and recommendation as EDA. So EDA and uh, NICE uh, societies uh, postulated that please recommend bariatric surgery for patients above 40 and please consider uh, bariatric uh, or metabolic surgery for patients above 30 BMI. The same recommendations are followed by several societies, like Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, the famous SAGES guidelines. The report is also updated in 2020 under the title of Clinical Application of Laparoscopic Bariatric Surgery. You can revise it. Also, the European Association of Endoscopic Surgery the so-called EIS, the, uh, about the clinical practice guidelines for bariatric surgery 2020. And this is endorsed by several eminent societies. And most importantly, the IFSO Society. The IFSO is the top society all over the world dealing with obesity. This is an abbreviation for the International Federation for the surgery of obesity. It includes more than 53 societies from all over the world. And the Canadian Diabetes Association about weight management in diabetes, clinical practice guidelines, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It should be noted that to achieve glycemic control, Monodrug therapy was found to be inadequate in most of the patients. And it seems that we need intensive drug therapy using poly or multiple drugs in the same time to obtain euglycemia and to prevent and delay complications. Drugs for type 2 diabetes are plenty, and you know this very well more than me, of course. But there are other drugs 
that are used for comorbidities for other components of metabolic surgery, like hypertension, drugs for dyslipidemia, drugs for sleep apnea, for osteoarthritis, drugs for hyperuricemia, for cancer related to obesity, for psychiatric disorders, etc. This is the second group of drugs. However, patients with metabolic syndrome have also a third group of drugs for treatment of associated complications like drugs to treat retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disorders, etc. This is quite a burden on the patient. Can we ameliorate this tragedy? A very eminent and important study known as SOS. It is published on behalf of the Swedish Obesity Study Group with thousands of patients. They made the study on more than 4,000 patients. And this study lasts for, lasted for 10 years, around 1,700 patients completed this survey. The study was on two groups of obese diabetic patients. One was treated by metabolic surgery, which is the study group, and the second control group was treated by intensive medical therapy. The results, as you see, about diabetes remission, after two years, Around 70% of patients undergone surgery, diabetes remission was achieved. Please compare with less than one quarter of patients for polydrug therapy, diabetes remission can be achieved. On the long term, after 10 years, diabetes remission could be achieved in around 37% of patients in comparison to diabetes remission with polydrug therapy could be achieved only in 13% of patients. Observe the p-value, it is very highly significant difference. However, metabolic surgery is not free from side effects, complications, and hazards. 30% of patients may develop nutritional deficiencies for amino acids, calcium, iron, folic acid, etc. 10% of patients may develop dumping syndrome, bioreflux gastritis, stomal ulceration, gastrointestinal bleeding, retrograde intussusception, intestinal obstruction, and biliary lithiasis. Perioperative mortality of bariatric surgery is usually less than 1%. In conclusion, we consider the criteria of success of metabolic surgery if we can achieve adequate weight loss. And the definition of adequate weight loss is rather controversial. However, most of societies approve that adequate weight loss means loss of more than 50% of excess weight or reduction of body mass index to, to below 30, which is uh, just an overweight and not obesity. And in this level of BMI below 30, the activity of metabolic syndrome, the insulin resistance, and inflammatory marker release all are reduced. The second criterion of success is improvement of comorbidities like diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and others. And lastly, improvement of the quality of life. Thank you.
دكتور ابراهيم شكرا جزيلا العفو يا دكتور شريف ربنا يخلي حضرتك انا مش عارف برضه هي هاله المفروض تبقى موجوده بس مش عارف ليه مش موجوده صوتك يا هاله الله يخليكي انت كده حضرتك قدمت لنا كالعاده برضه يعني <تصفيق> ريفيو رائع للكومبريهنسيف الحقيقه وازاي ولل... احنا ممكن نعمل حاجه مشتركه ما بيننا وما بين الجراحه يعني بليز اه وي نيد ا لارج كونجرس يا دكتور شريف بين بين جراحين و... و... ودكاتره بطنه مهتمين بالدايبيتولوجي و... و... yes. ونقعد مع بعض ونسمع بعض ونستفيد من بعض و... يعني <تصفيق> احنا دكتور ابراهيم هو الحقيقه اللي احنا عملنا لسه زي ما قلت لحضرتك دلوقتي من شويه الجمعيه الجديده بتاعتنا هتبقى متخصصه قوي في القصه دي لانها دايبيتس وهايبر تنشن وليبيدولوجي يعني زي ما حضرتك قدمت اللي هي الميتابوليك بقى كل اه بالظبط كل الكلام على الميتابوليك سندروم فهيبقى الحوار كروس توكس بيننا وبين حضراتكم في الجراحه مهم قوي لان زي ما لما انا كلمت حضرتك علشان المحاضره دي حضرتك قلت لي لا مش دايبيتس هتبقى ميتابوليك يس yes. وفعلا يعني اللي هو البارياتريك سيرجري خلينا بقى الميتابوليك سيرجري يعني yes. علشان ما تبقاش بس ادريسنج الدايابيتس ومش بس ادريسنج الاوبيزيتي ادريسنج كل ده على بعضه لان المالتيبل ميتابوليك ريسكس بيصبوا كلهم مع بعض فهي الحقيقه اور اسوسيشن which از كولد ذا ارب افريكان ايشن اسوسيشن الحقيقه في ناس حاضرين معانا هنا كتير قوي دلوقتي الاتنجليزي ما شاء الله زادوا جدا وحاضرين من من يوروب لان احنا في في لينك بيننا وبينهم حاضرين وكانوا حريصين جدا يسالوني ان هم يحضروا المحاضره دي كمان بالذات اللي هي الكروس توكس بين surgery and, uh, and uh, internal medicine and uh, for, for the attendees abroad I just want to thank you very much and uh, for your attendance and to announce that um, we will have many many uh, events inshallah in the upcoming months inshallah is I, I mean by events I mean um, events in uh, the diabetes hypertension lipidology and as well the, the um, cooperation between intern, internists and surgeons in this aspect to emphasize the um, um, idea that uh, we are cooperating together in this uh, aspect رأي حضرتك ايه دكتور ابراهيم انا يعني i'm willing to share in this activity please uh, i'll be glad and honored uh, and and i think i'll invite my uh, surgeons uh, uh, colleague surgeons to participate every one has his own experience actually we see this very much you know uh, now we recognize that obesity is not the sole problem of the patient uh, obesity when we treat obesity patients uh, uh, improve so much about diabetes i have patients who stopped completely diabetes treatment and however i have to insist upon uh, the effect of surgery is not consistent the effect of surgery uh, is uh, weakened with time it starts after two to three weeks after surgery to reappear again but in a very mild form and after 10 years of bariatric surgery the metabolic effect uh, is only uh, 35 to 40 percent of the starting effect so we start by improvement in three quarters of patients and this effect is gradually decreased up to 35 to 40 after 10 years i think this category only entails the bmi above 35 this is uh, 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 standard and now we are speaking about above 30 this is the recent recommendation we are thinking about implementing this metabolic surgery for bmi 30 with comorbidities but it is not yet standardized this standardized is above 35 bmi uh, professor ibrahim i just have a, a, a question which should which may seem weird or strange or something like that is there a role for surgery or, or bariatric surgery in the management of type 2 diabetes? It is a weird question. I'll have it clear. Uh, there are metabolic surgeons all over the world. Two pioneers, Francesco Robino, which is an Italian surgeon now uh, in uh, USA, and he is leading 
the Metabolic Surgery uh, Institute and Cohen in uh, Brazil. These mm -hmm. are the two eminent surgeons working on this. Please uh, don't think that surgery will cure diabetes. No, surgery will only cure metabolic syndrome, meaning diabetes should be associated with obesity to be treated. So all uh, studies, all trials about treating diabetes in non-obese patients, in normal BMI patients, till this moment are failure. Yes. So we don't implement the surgery for normal weight non-obese diabetics. Only if diabetes is a component of metabolic syndrome, meaning if it is associated with obesity. The results are marvelous. Very good. Very good. Uh, to end this uh, lecture, thank you very much once again and hoping that this co uh, cooperation between us as internists and diabetologists and you as surgeons will uh, be fruitful, inshallah, in the very, very near future and in the remote future in many events to come. Thank you very much, Professor Ibrahim, to see you next, inshallah. Thank you. Very thank much. you, Dr. Sharif. Thanks, Abu. Thank you. Um, and then I have my, uh, I, it will be my, it will give me great pleasure, pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Shirin Abdul Ghaffar. The, the very eminent professor, professor of pediatric endocrinology in Cairo University Qasrani Hospital to give us a lecture about the insulin pumps and the glucose sensors and in general, generally speaking about the technology and its effect in the treatment of type 1 diabetes. Professor Shereen, please. Thank you very much, Professor Sharif, for the introduction and for the kind invitation. I'm really honored to be part of this uh, distinguished conference. And actually, I enjoyed the, the lecture of Professor Ibrahim Galel, the talk between the surgeons and the internists. And now let us talk, let's have a talk between the pediatricians and the internists. So let me share uh, my screen. You cannot share. Dr. Ibrahim, would you please stop sharing your screen because you have to stop sharing your screen so, so that I can share mine. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. So, uh, I will talk about the challenges and the possible solutions for achieving the glycemic targets in children with type 1 diabetes, and I will focus on the role of the insulin pumps, how the pump works, what are the indications, what are the benefits, the disadvantages, the types and the different protocols, and the glucose sensors, its importance, indications, components, types and benefits. So, this is type 1 diabetes, the most common type of diabetes in children. And these are the four pillars of management. Insulin is the most important pillar together with the medical nutrition therapy, monitoring of blood glucose, and getting regular exercise. So, this is the guidelines, the ISPAD guidelines, and this is the most important guidelines that we follow in pediatrics. The International Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes speaking about insulin therapy and stressing that insulin treatments that mimics normal physiologic patterns as closely as possible remains the cardinal principle of treatment for type 1 diabetes. So our daily practice is the basal bolus insulin therapy trying to mimic the normal insulin secretion because there are basal insulin needs, background insulin needs, and also prandial insulin needs. So we give the basal bolus in the form of 50% basal insulin and 50% prandial insulin, trying to mimic the physiology and trying to achieve the targets, which is hemoglobin A1C less than seven, the pre-meal 70 to 130, post-meal 90 to 180, and pre-bed 80 to 140. However, these targets are, should be individualized. The hemoglobin A1C target 
should be individualized also to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia. Is it easy to achieve that in children? No, it's so challenging because children are not just miniature adults. The growth issue is very important because they have nutritional needs, the insulin doses change by time, they have variable exercise and eating patterns, critical cognitive development, so there is extreme fear of hypoglycemia, the physiologic and psychological burden of disease, the difficult diabetes care in school, and the dependence on the carers and the parents. All these are challenges. So let, us, let me introduce you to one of our children living with diabetes and um, discuss together what are the challenges and how can we cope with them. This is Ali. He is three years old. He has type 1 diabetes for two years now. His mother coming complaining that there are frequent hypoglycemias and frequent hyperglycemia. The child often refuses meals and he's a picky eater. He eats some types of food and refuses most of them. His weight is 19 kilograms. His hemoglobin A1C is really high, 9%. He is on rapid acting analog, three units before each meal, and a basal analog, 10 units, so it's one unit per kg per day. The mother is so afraid of hypoglycemia to the extent that she's giving the prandial insulin after meals. And she's trying always to keep the blood glucose above 200 because she, is, she has a panic that her child may go into hypoglycemia. Uh, we asked the mother to uh, record the uh, blood glucose readings. She showed that these three day readings of self blood glucose monitoring. And I, I would like you to observe the readings, the fasting, the post meals and the pre meals and the 3 a.m. readings. What, what do you think is the problem of Ali? Do you think he has whole, high all post-meal glucose levels? Low all post-meal glucose levels? Frequent hypoglycemia four hour post-meals? Or frequent hyperglycemia two hour post-meals? Or there is high variability in the glucose readings? Remember that more than one choice may be correct. Yes. The readings in red are the hypoglycemias and the readings in green are the hyperglycemias. There is frequent hypoglycemia late post meals, frequent hyperglycemia early post meals and high variability in the glucose readings. So what do you think we can uh, do to help Ali to change, for example, the basal insulin or to change maybe the prandial insulin or maybe to try to match the food with the insulin. Actually, Ali's mother is trying to do carb counting and she's trying to do this, but in vain. Actually, we tried to change the prandial at a time. We tried to change the basal, but still, as you see, some numbers have changed, but still there are frequent hypos and frequent hypers. So should we be more loose in metabolic control targets to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia? Most of the doctors and most of the mothers are so afraid of the hypoglycemia that in young children, they keep the blood glucose loose on the hyperglycemic side. Is that correct? Is that correct? Let us see the guidelines, the ISPAD guidelines. The ISPAD guidelines mentions that the target hemoglobin A1C for all children with type 1 diabetes, including the preschool children, including the very young, is recommended to be less than 7.5%. And this chart target is chosen with the aim of minimizing the hyperglycemia, the severe hypoglycemia, the hypoglycemic unawareness, and also reducing the likelihood of development of long-term complications. So the hypoglycemia is hazardous, but also the hyperglycemia is as much risky. So we always try to keep the balance, but sometimes it's really impossible. This is the normal secretion of the pancreas. Yes, and about 50% is prandial and 50% is basal, but 
let us see what we do with the basal bolus therapy. There are any gaps between the pancreas insulin production and the multiple daily injections. You see, insulin is coming up and down and blood glucose is coming up and down and the metabolic control is really difficult. You see? That's what the insulin pump is all about. An insulin pump is able to give insulin in a more similar fashion to a pancreas than multiple injections. You see how skillful is the pump. And for that reason, the ISPAD guidelines mentions that insulin pump therapy is the preferred method of insulin administration even for young children who are aged less than seven years with type 1 diabetes. Premixed insulins, we never use them. The basal bolus therapy is the daily practice. But you see here, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. And when we compare that to the insulin pump therapy, you can stabilize the blood glucose more efficiently. Actually, the diabetes technology has evolved much during the past several years, starting from the 1776, when also people used to do urine testing, and then the urine test strips in the 1900, and then insulin injections 1922, 1977 came the blood glucose meters, then the insulin pump therapy started in 1978. But see how large was an insulin pump this man is holding on his back. And then 1999, we got the glucose sensors. 2005, the real-time continuous glucose monitoring has evolved. There is real revolution in the technology. In the 2010, the low glucose suspend means when the blood glucose drops down, the pump can suspend insulin therapy, can shut off the insulin therapy. 2015, suspend before low and resume. This means that the pump and the sensor can predict that blood glucose is going down or blood glucose is going up and adjustment of insulin goes. And then the technology is revoluting and revolving on and on. Let's go now to the insulin pumps and see how it really works. These are the insulin pump components. This is the pump itself and having the reservoir inside filled with insulin. And usually the insulin that is present now in Egypt uh, contains, can, can take a reservoir of 300 units, just like the insulin pen. And here is the cannula and the insulin infusion set where uh, the reservoir is connected through a tube and the cannula pours down insulin underneath the skin. And here is the sensor which is connected, reads the blood glucose and is connected to the pump to give like a loop, a, a trying to, to have like a closed loop with the pump in order to adjust the blood glucose and to adjust the insulin delivery. And this blood glucose reading can show on the screen of the pump so that the patient can follow up his blood glucose and his insulin injections. So how does the pump differs from the basal bolus insulin that we give? You see, when we give a basal bolus insulin therapy by the pens, we give a shot of a basal insulin once per day. But see here, the basal rates of the pump can be different over the 24 hours. You can have five different basal profiles. For example, you can adjust the pump. This is the basal profile for the exercise. This is the basal profile for the school. This is the basal profile for the vacation. So that the basal profile can be adjusted and inside each profile, you can have 48 different basal re rates in each profile. So see how flexible the insulin adjustment can be. And it can be changed whenever needed. You can have temporary basal profiles whenever is needed. And of course, we all know about the problem of the Doan phenomenon. 
when the blood glucose rises at 3 a.m. And it's sometimes very difficult to adjust with the conventional insulin therapy. So here you can increase the basal rate in the dawn time so that you can control this dawn phenomena. And then let's see the delivery of the boluses. It's very flexible. You can adjust, even if the child eats, for example, six times, you can give six boluses. It's very difficult with the pen to prick the child six or seven or eight times per day, but actually with a pump and, and an inserted cannula, you can give as many boluses as the child's schedule of eating is. It's customized and customized to the lifestyle and you can decrease and increase according to uh, exercise to avoid hypos or even if you have heavy meals. So giving the insulin with the pen, you can only have one shot of a bolus insulin, but see the types of boluses that can be given through an insulin pump. You can give a standard bolus like that which is given by a pen. You can give what is called a square wave bolus or a dual wave bolus. You see the square wave? Suppose the child eats slowly for two hours. You can just fractionate this bolus insulin dose over two hours. You can have a square wave bolus. Or oh, suppose the child eats, for example, a fatty meal or a high protein meal. Sometimes we need what we call a dual bolus, giving half of the dose, for example, before the meal, and then you give the rest over, for example, two or three hours. So see how the flexibility of this pump therapy. But of course, the pump, up till now, it's not a closed loop. The pump that is available up till now, it's called a hybrid closed loop. This means that the patient has to enter the blood glucose reading if he, there is no sensor related or connected to the pump. And then, of course, also the child or the mother should enter the carb intake so that the uh, pump can calculate the bolus. You see here, for example, the effect of carb, protein, fats, sugar on the blood sugar. For example, if the child eats a carbohydrate, a rich carbohydrate meal, carbohydrates have rapid digestion, total absorption and conversion to glucose by 100%. If taking sugar alcohols, there is moderate digestion, partial absorption. If the child has a heavy protein meal, proteins are slowly digested and partially converted to glucose only 40%. You see the purple curve. The fats have very slow absorption and have little conversion to glucose, less than 20%. And for this reason, the boluses, the type of boluses will differ. For example, with the carbohydrate and the sugar alcohol, you will give the standard bolus. With the proteins and the fats, you will give the square bolus or maybe you will give the dual bolus. So we use the short acting or the rapid acting insulin inside the pump. And the, uh, it has to be changed every two to three days. This reduces the variation in absorption due to the site rotation, you see. And it is tailored to the individual needs, as we said. This is the uh, pump that is available now in Egypt, the Medtronic Mini Med 670 hybrid closed loop system. It is available and we have many patients on this pump and it has automated adjustments in subcutaneous insulin basal rates based on continuous glucose monitoring readings. So is the pump for every patient? No, not for every patient. These are the indications for pump therapy. If the A1C is not at goal, despite best MDI efforts, if there is variable blood glucose swings, if there is unpredictable hypoglycemia, dawn phenomena, the time is range is not optimum, there is extreme insulin sensitivity, there is gastroparesis, erratic schedules, or desire for flexibility. And these, of course, the advantages of the pump therapy. It reduces the hypoglycemia, reduces the variability, better hemoglobin A1C, better quality of life. But of course, it has some disadvantages because 
Some people think that if you have the pump, you can forget about diabetes and the pump do, does it all. No, it requires problem solving skills. If the pump stops from working, there is a high risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. It's expensive. It requires training and mastering new skills. And some people don't like machines. They feel like chained to diabetes. These are other insulin pumps which are present, but the only types present in Egypt are the Medtronic pumps. These are the, uh, and the, uh, the most recent one is the 670, but actually uh, within two or three weeks, we will have a newer uh, version of the pump uh, in Egypt, uh, which is called the Minimed 780G. And this has a sensor called SmartGuard technology. It prevents the highs and the lows. It prevents the highs, giving more insulin if the arrows of um, the sensor is going or less insulin if the arrows are trending low. So it auto-corrects high early before they occur even, predicting the hypos and the hyper and adjusting the insulin uh, very quickly. And this is actually uh, the protocol. Maybe we don't have time now. Maybe we, we may have asked Dr. Sharif to have other like uh, workshop sessions to see how we calculate the doses and how we calculate the basal rates and how we calculate the boluses and then how we just uh, press the buttons on the pump to give the patient actually the doses that he really needs. All these are like calculations that we do and we insert in the pump. So the pump needs to be programmed according to the patient's or the child's own style. Uh, it doesn't work automatically. You have to insert the data uh, that you think is proper for this patient. And you have also to calculate what is called the insulin carb ratio because the child will insert into the pump. Now I have eaten 60 grams of carbohydrate and we program the pump by what we call the insulin carb ratio. So if the pump knows, for example, that every 15 grams of carb needs for this child one unit of insulin, and then the child says, I have eaten now, he inserts into the pump, I have eaten 60 grams of carb, so the pump knows that it will uh, pump four units of insulin. So this is the insulin carb ratio we usually calculated by after knowing the total daily dose of the insulin, we divide 500 over the total daily dose and we get how many grams of carb needing, how many units of insulin. We put this into the pump and when the child puts the amount of food he eats, the pump uh, automatically uh, uh, injects the proper type of insulin. It's also important to calculate what is called the insulin sensitivity factor, which means every unit of insulin leads to drop of how many milligrams of glucose. And we do that by dividing 1,700 over the total daily dose and we give the number. So suppose the child has 33 units of insulin per day and we divide 1,700 by 33, we get 50, means that if we want to correct the blood glucose by decreasing 50 uh, milligram, this needs one unit of insulin. If the blood glucose is high by 100 milligram than the target, then the pump has to inject a correctable dose or a correcting dose of two units. So it, leads, it needs a lot of programming and a lot of training. It's not just uh, doing it very automatically. So that, that's all about the pump today. A quick note about the glucose sensors, the importance and the indications. Let's go back again to Ali and see his highly variable blood glucose readings. He's doing the self blood glucose monitoring seven times per day. And many of the patients and the mother sees that seven times per day is too much. But actually now we can say it's even not enough. Why? Because the glucose variability increases the mortality and the morbidity, and it's related to complications. And glucose variability predicts future risk of hypoglycemia, because if there is hypose and hyper, and you try to adjust by increasing the insulin 
you may go into the threshold of hypoglycemia, but if there is low variability and you try to adjust the insulin, you are far away from getting into the hypoglycemia. And the studies have uh, proved that time spent in hypoglycemia is significantly reduced with continuous glucose monitoring. You cannot now rely only on the hemoglobin A1C because as you see here, these two patients, the one in red and the one in the blue, both have a perfect hemoglobin A1C, but see how much the variability, the blood glucose is going up and going down. And you see here also in these two patients, although they have perfect hemoglobin A1C, but the one below has a highly variable blood glucose. So it needs to be adjusted hour by hour, not only by self blood glucose monitoring twice or thrice per day. And now we have the concept of the timing range that the patient uh, should be from 70 to 180 milligram per deciliter in more than 70% of the time. How can you accomplish this except if you have a continuous glucose monitoring uh, uh, technique? The guideline says if you don't have the CGM, you have to do the self blood glucose monitoring finger stick six to 10 times per day to optimize the intensive control. And of course, this is very difficult for the child. And these are the components of the uh, CGM. The components of the CGM, uh, which is there is like a sensor and a transmitter which transmits to the pump uh, uh, by a receiver. But actually these sensors, they do not measure the capillary blood glucose. They measure the blood glu the glucose in the interstitial fluid which is somewhat different than the blood glucose by about 30 to 40 milligram per deciliter. So actually one has to know that CGM lags behind capillary readings and there is some gap. So sometimes we cannot rely on this CGM if the blood glucose is getting very low or is getting very high, there has to be calibration and there has to, uh, to, to do self blood glucose monitoring still. But what is uh, very uh, nice about these sensors is that they give you some errors, telling you blood glucose is going up, blood glucose is going down, so that you can adjust your insulin before the hypoglycemia occurs or before the hyperglycemia occurs. And of course, it tracks the blood glucose over the 24 hours. So definitely uh, it um, ensures that uh, the child and the mother keeps uh, um, a very good blood glucose control over the 24 hours and keeping the time in range. Even the sensors, they give the readings of the time in range and it can be downloaded through the mobiles, uh, through the computers, through the tablets, as you see here. And also it can be discussed with the health professional. What is the problem? What is the cause of the hyperglycemia? What is the cause of the hypoglycemia? So that there can be a customized action plan for this child. There are two types of uh, monitoring, monitors, the continuous monitors, and also the flash glucose monitoring system that it has to be scanned in order to be read. Uh, the most common are the Dexcom. The Dexcom G6 is the most recent and also the Freestyle Libre. Many of our patients are using this flash monitoring, the Freestyle Libre to keep track of the blood glucose of their child over the 24 hours. And uh, of course, the technology is going on. They are now trying to work on disposable CGM and to work on implantable CGM to make things more easy and uh, more practical uh, for the children. You see, when you get the blood glucose tracings, you can really avoid the hypoglycemia. You can see what the meal does with the blood glucose. If you have a high fat meal, or if you give, you can give more insulin boluses. If you see that you are, your blood glucose is rising, you can see if you're doing some mistakes with the food or some mistakes with the insulin because everything is, strain, is um, traced on the monitor and everything can be downloaded and can be studied. Uh, the connectivity, the child, uh, the mother or the uh, family uh, physician can have like, um, uh, uh, if the child downloads the tracings, the doctor can even in a remote uh, area monitor the child's tracings or the mother can monitor the child's tracings in school 
And now, uh, of course, the, the, there is revolution about how the connectivity is better. You can connect now with the phone uh, to connect uh, uh, during uh, uh, in the car. You can see your blood glucose. So the key messages about the glucose sensors is that using um, uh, uh, continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, of course, makes you achieve the required diabetes good control. This the pump. Using the pump is best for diabetes good control. But in order to achieve this good control, we need proper patient selection and we need very good patient education. The insulin pump therapy is extremely cost effective. Why? Because you will adjust the blood glucose, you will prevent the complications, and you will reduce the cost of treating the complications, the laser uh, for the retinopathy, the dialysis, the renal transplantation. So it's really cost effective, even if you think that it is expensive. Continuous glucose monitoring system is the best way to filter the patients to check their eligibility for the pump therapy. The real-time CGM is the best way for glucose monitoring in the ICU and uh, even in difficult and challenging cases. And these are the SPAD guidelines, which documents all we, what we have said and documents the values of the insulin pump and the values of the CGM. These are my references. And thank you very much. And I was honored and pleased to be with you during this session and hope to meet you soon in more and more sessions about uh, diabetes in children, whether technology or even the daily practice of uh, diabetic children. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Shireen Layani. I should say that I am super impressed by your presentation. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so much impressed by this. Uh, um, a very elegant presentation, comprehensive in all the details. You summed up every single detail concerning the insulin pumps as well as the glucose sensors. And uh, you made it certain, uh, there's a certain point I, uh, I, uh, yani I focused on, which was the basal insulin in the pumps, that you made it certain that it, it could be tailored. Yes. I mean, uh, yes, because there were five profiles you showed Tailoring the basal insulin is an, is an option which can help patients because, as you mentioned, the basal insulin is not fixed uh, in all yes. situations. So thank you very much again. And um, I, I, I should uh, ask you if, if you are ready to join us in future events as well, inshallah, because we will... My honor and pleasure. It's not, we, it's not only will be our honor and pleasure, but if you, <laughs> add, you will add to us a, a great value indeed, indeed. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, inshallah, in future events, we will be together, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Hala, inti, lesa, hala, inti, fein. Ya hala, Allah yikhaliki, ya na'amal, a moderate, wa inti, ya ha, taib. Ahna andina ba'da keda, al muhadra, hala, inti, mawbuda, wa la na'amal, eh? اه انا موجودة بس الـ الـ النت وحش قوي عندي معرفش ليه عايزة اقعد اظبط فيه طيب ما تعمليش فينا كده كتير الله يخليكي عشان احنا محتاجينك جدا اه لا طبعا عندك عندنا محاضرة بتاعتك بقى طب بليز تقدمي بقى بعد كده علشان ان تحبي تفضلي هتقدمي اه دي واحدة بس س... س... انت انت سمعني كويس سامع كويس جدا سامع كويس قوي اه Uh, أنا بس عشان بطلع البروجرام معلش أسفة يا جماعة بس okay. لأن الإنترنت كانت مغلس قوي وكانت كل شوية المحاضرة بتقطع أنت ممكن تقدم دلوقتي بس okay. الشيء لحد okay. ما okay. بس إحنا يعني our next lecture in this symposium about diabetes will be honored by the um, uh, presence or by the lecture that it is read it is a um, a lecture by Professor Mohamed Reda Halawa uh, about the best of both worlds. It is a Sanofi symposium. The next lecture is a Sanofi symposium presented by Professor Mohamed Reda Halawa, a professor of uh, internal medicine and diabetes in uh, Ain Shams University. It is not um, a live um, lecture, it is actually a recorded lecture. So please go on. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته في الاول احب اشكر طبعا 
آه الاورجنايزنج آه كوميتي لدعوتي ولحضور طبعا المشاركه في المؤتمر آه المودرن ايجيبشن سوسايتي اوف انترنست وطبعا الاسوشيشن اوف دايبيتس هايبرتنشن اند ليبيدولوجي وطبعا الاستاذ دكتور شريف الهواري وبشكر طبعا شركه سانوفي على دعوتي to present their, uh, uh, the presentation in their symposium. Uh, today, as we see here uh, in the title, uh, we'll talk about oral anti-diabetics, the best of both worlds, uh, on behalf of Sanofi, uh, which uh, presents or uh, uh, will launch a new uh, product, uh, uh, the uh, DABA, ديف ا نيو لونش اوف دابجليفلوزين واحنا زي ما احنا عارفين طبعا سانوفي دايبيتس طبعا هاز ا هيفي كونتريبيوشن ان ذا اريا اوف دايبيتس مانجمنت من خلال الاورال وي الانسولين وطبعا النيو كامر اجين ذا كومبينيشن بين اس جي ال تي ذا جي ال بي 1 اغونيست اند انسولين جلارج Uh, to start, we will highlight the metabolic effects of SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, as we all know, the uh, kidney uh, absorb all the glucose filtered through the glomerulus. This is a inherent uh, physiological action. So no glucose will go to the urine except if exceeding the uh, threshold of renal absorption. However, with the uh, inhibition of the SGLT2, which is responsible for the absorption of glucose in the proximal tubule, this will reduce the renal threshold of absorption of glucose and will lead to excess glucose excretion in the urine independent of insulin secretion. This uh, impact Increased glucosuria will lead to reduce the HbA1c and reduce the glucose toxicity, improve insulin resistance, and increase beta cell function, and reduce the uh, body weight. All this we call it glycemic effect of SGLT2. Again, there is increased natriuresis and osmotic diuresis. And this associated with reduced plasma volume, decrease, decrease fill interstitial fluid, a reduction fill blood pressure, we, uh, a reduction fill glomerular hyperfiltration with extra glycemic benefit. Uh, both of this will lead to metabolic, cardiovascular, and renal improvement. If we go to the uh, Consensus ADAASD for pharmacological <laughs> treatment of type 2 diabetes. As we all know, the first line of treatment is metformin plus comprehensive lifestyle, <coughs> including physical exercise and a balanced diet. Next step to the metformin and lifestyle modifications and important questions will be answered to decide if the patient is not glycemic control. If there's indication of high risk or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure. So we'll go to the next step by adding either GLP-1 receptor agonist if the patient have atherosclerotic cardiovascular uh, predominance GLP-1 receptor agonist and or GLP-1 receptor uh, 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 GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors to prevent the cardiovascular disease. If the patient have CKD, so SGLT2 will be uh, recommended with reduced evidence of heart failure and CKD. But if no, high risk of cardiovascular disease or CKD and other compelling needs like needs to minimize the hypoglycemia. We can add another medicine plus SGLT2 uh, 
uh, in the choices, GBB4 inhibitors, GLPAR receptor agonists, or TZDs, or there is a compelling need for weight loss, so SGLG2 or GLPAR receptor agonists, if not glycemic control. And as we see, if the uh, cost is an issue, so sulfonylurea and TZDs as a next step for glycemic control. Focusing on the dabagliflozin, SGLG2 inhibitor, Actually, dabagliflozin has a consistent HP1C reduction over a number of combination, evidence-based with a broad range of treatments, either monotherapy, add to metformin, add to sulfonylurea, or add to uh, DBB4 inhibitors in sulfonylurea. As we see, there is a significant reduction of HP1C compared to the placebo. Dabagliflozin can lead to a reduction of HB1C up to 2.6%, starting a baseline HB1C more than 10, which is sig significant uh, in the glycemic control at 24 weeks. Dabagliflozin, as add on to metformin versus sulfonylurea, has a comparable reduction of the HbA1c with a numerical comparability over uh, uh, 208 weeks. With this reduction, there is a sustained improvement for HbA1c, as we see here, minus 0.2 percent versus minus 0.1 percent for the uh, dabagliflozin and a sustainable improvement fee in body weight over the 208 weeks. Not only in the clinical trials, randomized trial, but also in the rare world, reduction for weight after dabagliflozin in initiation of UK primary care clinical practice research data link has a comparable results for the uh, reduction in the body weight as we see here, which reflects a real world benefit with the added reduction of the body weight. Dabagliflozin added to metformin leads to significant reduction of the weight, and this weight reduction is in, in the fat mass, as we see here, placebo minus 2.12 versus uh, dabagliflozin minus 4.4. Uh, 54 kg, additional about 2.5 kg. As we see here, the reduction in the fat mass more than the lean mass. The SGLT2 inhibitors versus DBB4 inhibitors provide a larger reduction for HPE1C and body weight. Here is some. Uh, trials, Di Fronzo, Franini, uh, Lavili, and it showed a reduction fee in HPE1C and again reduction fee in body weight compared to the DBB4 inhibitors. What about the role of SGD22 inhibitor in the cardiovascular prevention? The cardiovascular outcome trial study cohort for SGLT2. We have three landmark trials, the embarrack outcome trial, and this embarrack outcome trial involves an established cardiovascular disease patient 100%, which considered as a second prevention trial. The CANVAS tr program used canagliflozin, and it involved a 66% patients with established cardiovascular disease, and 34% patients with uh, multiple cardiovascular risk factors. So it can consider mainly as uh, uh, secondary prevention and partially as a primary prevention. And the third landmark trial of SGLT2 inhibitor cardiovascular outcome studies is the DECLARE trial 
and which involved only a 40% of patients with established cardiovascular disease, and 60% of patients with multiple risk factor. So, patient with established cardiovascular disease involves coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral arterial disease, and this considered as a second prevention. The multiple risk factors without established cardiovascular disease is other factors, as we see in two-thirds fee in DECLARE and one-third in the CANVAS probe. Again, this is a, a, a rapid comparison between the three trials. As we see here for the dabagliflozin, DECLARE, it's the largest with more than 17,000 patients compared to the can cannabis and uh, uh, embarrig trials. With the longest duration about 4.2 years, and as we said before, it's mainly considered as a primary prevention because mm -hmm. patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is only 40%. What about the declared TIMI 58 trial? It involves about more than 17,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, HbA1c, from 6.5 to 12%, more than 40 years with established, uh, more than 40 years with established cardiovascular disease, and more than 55 years men. 60 years female with one or more cardiovascular risk factor, the multiple risk factors. One to one comparison placebo versus dabagliflozin 10 milligram plus other anti glycemic per the treating physician. And this is the uh, uh, average duration, medium follow up is 4.5 years. The primary safety and efficacy outcome include dual primary efficacy endpoints. First, three-point maze, cardiovascular death, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI, and hospitalization from heart failure and cardiovascular death. Second endpoint include renal composite uh, endpoints, and again, secondary endpoint, all cause mortality. Coming to the results, the dabagliflozin has a significant reduction of the hospitalization from heart failure and cardiovascular death with a 17% relative risk reduction with statistically, statistically significant value. And numerical reduction of the mace but didn't reach a statistical significance for the three-point miss, as we said. The uh, patient on dabagliflozin has a significant reduction of cardiovascular death, about 45% relative risk reduction, statistically significant, and all cause this statistically reduced with dabagliflozin about 41% either with the presence or absence of uh, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Again, the babiflozin has a significant reduction of the mace and hospitalization of heart failure, cardiovascular death compared to placebo, both in the presence or absence of prior MI. Mace reduced by 16% relative risk reduction and hospitalization from heart failure and cardiovascular death by 19%. Another important trial for a, an interesting outcome, which is the heart failure, the DABA heart failure, which is an international multicenter, even driven randomized double blind parallel group placebo controlled study. This study 
include adults more than 18 with heart failure, knee high classification class from two to four heart failure, with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40, and pro, in, pro PNP more than 600, estimated GFR more than 30 milli per minute per 1.7 meter square, and stable heart failure treatment, standard of care heart failure treatment. Uh, double blind, one to one, placebo, plus the standard treatment of heart failure versus DABA, 10 milligram once per day. 4,000 point and 744, with the estimated study duration around 33 months and average estimated follow-up is 24 months. The primary comes to endpoint is cardiovascular death and heart failure event. And the results was very significant actually, because this trial includes post-diabetics and non-diabetics. The primary endpoint comes to endpoint cardiovascular death, hospitalization of heart failure, significant reduced by 26% which was statistically significant. And the number needed to treat over this time of period is 21. The component of primary endpoint, worsening of heart failure event reduced by 30%, relative risk reduction, which is highly statistically significant in DABA versus placebo. The cardiovascular death again statistically significant reduced by 18%, which was statistically significant in DABA compared to the placebo. Another important extra benefit from the SGLT2 inhibitors is the renal prevention. This evidence comes from the DECLARE trial and in the declared the overall populations, the instance of renal comes to end point. The renal comes to end point includes reduction more than 40% progression for estimated glomerular GFR or the development of new end stage renal disease or death from renal or cardiovascular disease. There is a 4.3% fidabagliflozin group versus 5.6% field placebo group with 24% relative risk reduction in the renal composite endpoint. This evidence again confirmed in a specific trial conducted to patients with CKD in the DABA CKD trial, which is designed to investigate the dabagliflozin benefits or renal outcome in patients with CKD with or without type 2 diabetes. The populations included with estimated GFR min 25 to 75, with a three months history of increased albuminuria, with urinary albumin creatinine ratio min 200 light, 5,000 milligram per gram, on the maximum tolerated daily dose of rasplocate, either ACE inhibitor or ARB for at least four weeks. So DABA added plus the standard treatment known for the uh, prevention of the progression of kidney disease. Again, double blind, one to one, DABA gliflozin, two dose, 10 milligram or five milligram per day versus placebo. And the endpoint, primary comes in point, time for the first, more than 50% sustained decline field estimated GFR, reaching end stage renal disease, cardiovascular or renal death. Secondary endpoint, time two, first event in the composite of more than 50% sustained decline field estimated GFR, reaching end-stage renal disease or renal death. First event in COMS 
of cardiovascular death of heart failure, death from any cause. Again, the results was striking for the, for the primary outcome, sustained more than 50% estimated GFR decline, reduction for end stage renal disease and renal or cardiovascular disease by 39% relative risk reduction, which, which is very highly statistically significant in the dibagliflozin compared to the placebo. Again, the secondary outcome for all cause mortality reduced by 31% relative risk reduction in the dibagliflozin compared to the placebo. Another important efficacy and safety trial of dabagliflozin in patients with type 2 diabetes and moderate renal impairment, CKD, stage 3A in the DRIVE study. This DRIVE study involves 60% patients more than 65 years with HbA1c is 8.3, body mass index <coughs> estimated uh, is 32 and estimated GFR 53 patient, 50% 50 of them on insulin. The trial showed that there is extra reduction of HbA1c with dabagliflozin versus the placebo, which is statistically significant. And viewing or reviewing the adverse effect between the dabagliflozin and placebo, there is a comparable safety and adverse effect, any adverse effects, uh, a serious adverse effects, and even the genital and urinary tract infections, which we all know it's slightly increased in the uh, DABA and SGLT2 compared to the placebo. However, the others like hypotension, renal impairment, bone fractions, and DKA was comparable and no risk of uh, this problem. Uh, when we go for the uh, benefit, weighing the benefit versus the risk for SGL2 inhibitors, we'll find that reduction of MACE, reduction of cardiovascular mortality, reduction of total mortality, reduction of heart failure, CKD, and even uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, weighing heavily versus the risk of any other adverse effect because of this, uh, uh, of this safety issues are very minimal. To conclude, dabagliflozin significantly improves the glycemic control versus placebo in patients whether as immunotherapy or inadequately controlled on other oral anti-diabetic drugs or insulin, dabagliflozin lowers weight significantly and not associated with the risk of hypoglycemia. Dabagliflozin has benefit for cardiovascular and renal outcome. And with this, I reach to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for being with you this time. I will not talk here, inshallah, Qariban. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Well, for this interesting uh, lectures, and then I felt a little bit of a little ما فيش أسئلة خالص جت في ال questions في ال chatting يعني فاحنا هننتقل بقى لل ل the last lecture وطبعا I'm honored to present Professor Dr عبد العاطي from Alexandria University على أساس هو طبعا إحنا عارفين professor of internal medicine department in Alexandria University will he will talk in the Sanofi symposium about the winner 
كومباينيشن وطبعا احنا عارفين اللي هي بقى السوليكوا وهنتمتع طبعا زي ما دايما بنتمتع مع الدكتور طلعت في محاضراته اتفضل يا استاذ طلعت لا الصوت الصوت بتاع حضرتك حضرتك اعمل الصوت هو احنا مش سامعين حاجه هو عامل ميوت اه اعمل الصوت حضرتك اعمل ان ميوت ان ميوت لا صوت حضرتك مش موجود حضرتك فوق ايوه طيب اوكي اللي هي سامعيني كده؟ اه لا كده سامعينا كده يا استاذ طه ماشي ازي يا دكتور شريف ازي حضرتك كل سنه وحضرتك طيب ربنا يخليك يا دكتور عالة ازي حضرتك الله يخليك ربنا يخليك طيب بشكركم طبعا على الحضور وبشكر سانوفي على دعوتها ليا ان انا اتكلم مع حضراتكم النهارده تايب 2 والتريتمنت جاب ده الديفلوبمنت اوف تريتمنت في تايب 2 اول ما بنبدا بنبدا باورال وان اورال وبعد كده بندخل تو اورال وبعدين ثري اورال وبعدين بنبدا ندخل بيزال انسولين وبالرغم من كده العيانين بيبقوا ستيل ان كنترولد دي ستادي معموله اللي هي انترناشونال ديابيتس مانجمنت براكس ستادي ووضح فيها الهدف ان انا بنشوف المانجمنت اوف تايب 2 ديابيتيك وكمان التايب 1 وهل هم وصلوا للتارجت ولا لا في الاستادي دي عدد كتير من العيانين ما وصلش للتارجت يمكن 17% من العيانين بس وصلوا الى التارجت في تايب 2 و12% من العيانين في تايب 1 السبب ايه ممكن يكون كذا سبب احنا عارفين تايب 2 ده مالتيبل باثوجينيك ميكانيزم تاني حاجه لما بتيجي تدي دواء للعيان ممكن ما تبقاش تارجت كل الباثوجينيك ابنورماليتي الموجوده في تايب 2 بتبقى خايف من الريسك اوف هايبوجلايسيميا بتبقى خايف من الريسك بتاع الويت جين اوف ذا ميديكيشن التريتمنت جول For a patient with type 1 and type 2, should tackle the three arms: fasting, عايزه يبقى من 80 إلى 130; postprandial, عايزه 180; A1C 7. وطبعا individualization of the target according to the patient. إنما معظم العيانين لازم أبقى في القصة دي. الاثنين, the fasting and the two-hour postprandial, بيمثلوا the A1C. كل ما اروح ناحيه اللو بيبقى البوست برانديال اكتر كل ما يبقى الاي 1 سي عالي يبقى الفاستنج اكتر كومبوننت طيب التريتمنت الجوريزم فور ذا بيشنت اوف تايب 2 وده 2020 واللي انا هتكلم عليه النهارده هو دواء اللي هو السليكوا كومباينيشن ما بين البيزال انسولين والجي ال بي 1 وضع الجي ال بي 1 ووضع البيزال انسولين في الجايد لاين اي الجي ال بي 1 محطوطه فيرست لاين ثيرابي في الناس اللي عندهم اثيروسكلروتيك كارديو فاسكولار ديزيز افتر ميتفورمين والناس اللي عندهم هارت فيلير او سي كي دي يبقى الجزء اللي فيه كومبليكيشن محطوط الجي ال بي 1 كفيرست لاين ثيرابي الجزء اللي ما فيهوش كومبليكيشن محطوطه جي ال بي 1 لو انا عايز اقلل الهايبوجلايسيميا او لو عايز اقلل الويت لو حبيت اعمل انتنسيفيكيشن للتريتمنت للعيان اللي هو التايب 2 العيان اللي هو التايب 2 بعد ما بوصل الى الماكسيمم اورال ببدا اعمل انتنسيفيكيشن يا اما احط جي ال بي 1 او بيزال انسولين امتى ابدا بالبيزال انسولين لو انا عايز رابيد ريدكشن اوف ذا اي 1 سي 
لو العيان عنده سيفير هايبر جلايسيميا في الحاله دي بفضل البيزل انسولين او العيان عنده سيفير كاتابوليك ستيت افضل البيزل انسولين قبل الجي ال بي 1 انما لو العيان ما عندوش الحاجات دي يفضل جي ال بي 1 قبل البيزل انسولين وبعد كده I can intensify by both أحط جيل بي 1 مع بيزل إنسولين أو أمشي في سكة تانية لو عندي بيزل إنسولين أبدأ أحط بيزل بلس 1 شورت أكتنج قبل مين ميل بعدين بيزل بلس 2 وبعدين بيزل بولس يبقى دي 1 of intensification another way of intensification إن أنا أحط بيزل إنسولين مع جيل بي 1 أجونست ادي امتى كونسيدر انسولين كانيشال ثيرابي والعكس كونسيدر جي ال بي 1 وبعد كده اي كان انتنسفاي باي بوث طيب المشكله بقى في الانتنسفيكيشن لما احط فيكسد دوز كومباينيشن فيكسد دوز كومباينيشن في كذا حاجه كنت ممكن احط شورت اكتنج انسولين مع انترميديت اكتنج ده فيكسد دوز كومباينيشن ممكن احط بيزل انسولين مع شورت اكتنج دي انذر فيكسد دوز كومباينيشن ممكن احط بيزل انسولين مع جي ال بي 1 ادي بيزل انسولين مع جي ال بي 1 مش اللي زي السيليكوا ايه البارير بقى اللي بتقابلني في الفيكسد دوز كومباينيشن اول حاجه ممكن الهايبوجلايسيميا لما بحط مثلا شورت اكتنج انسولين مع انترميديت في مشكله الهايبوجلايسيميا ولازم العين ياخده في ميعاد ثابت وهكذا لو حطيت الدواء بتاع النهارده مثلا اللي هو السيليكوا سيليكوا اذا كومباينيشن اوف بيزل انسولين مع شورت اكتنج جي ال بي 1 بيحل لي مشكله الهايبوجلايسيميا بيحل لي مشكله الويت جين بيديني واي اوف انتنسيفيكيشن اوف تريتمنت بيديني سنجل انجكشن يبقى ده السيليكوا الحاجات اللي ممكن يتميز بيها وبيحل مشكله الفيكس دوز كومباينيشن طب عندنا ايفيدنس على هذا الكلام؟ يس yes. ادي السيليكوا السيليكوا از a combination of basal insulin plus short acting GLP-1 البيزل انسولين اللي هو جلارجين والبيزل انسولين ده بيبقى directed toward بيزل انسولين directed toward fasting blood sugar الشورت اكتنج او GLP-1 بيبقى directed toward the postprandial blood glucose يبقى when I use this fixed dose combination between insulin glargine and short acting GLP-1 lexinotide, I can tackle the post arm of glycated hemoglobin. I tackle the fasting and I tackle the post prandial blood sugar. And the mechanism of the action of GLP-1, GLP-1. أو جلوكاجون لايك -like بيبتايد اللي بينتمي إليها لكزيناتايد. ال GLP1 one of the incretin hormone act on all these target organ. act on the stomach delay gastric emptying acting on the pancreas increasing insulin secretion على الالفه سيل البيتا سيل اقلل الجلوكاجون زودت الانسولين بايوسينسيز زودت البيتا سيل بروليفريشن انهبت الابوبتوزس شغله على البنكرياس كله ان اجلوكوز ديبندنت مانر لو انا عندي هايبر جلايسيميا اشتغل على بيتا سيل واطلع انسولين لو عندي هايبوجلايسيميا اشتغل على الالفا سيل واطلع جلوكاجون يبقى ده اي تاكل كمان على الليفر قللت الهباتي جلوكوز برودكشن على البرين قللت الابيتايت 
وعلى الاديبوز تيشو حسنت الانسولين سنسيتيفيتي على الهارت عملت كارديو بروتكتيف افكت يبقى ده الاكشن او جي ال بي 1 اللي بينتمي اليه الريكوا كومباينيشن اوف جي ال بي 1 اند بيزل انسولين طيب مين ياخد السريكوا العيان اللي هو ماشي على بيشن ان كنترولد على الاورال ومعاه جي ال بي 1 اللي هو الاكزيناتايد الون او عيان كان ماشي على اورال برضو وبيزل انسولين الون الحاله دي ممكن اغير وادي له الكومباينيشن اللي هو الريكوا الايفيدنس اللي اتعملت او الدراسات اللي اتعملت على السيليكوا الاستادي دي عينين تايب 2 نوت كنترولد على الاورال ده ووش اوت بيرد وادي البيشنت كاركترستيك عين على ميتفورمين بلس سكند اورال وممكن كمان سيرد اورال والاي 1 سي من 7 لغايه 9 واللي على ميتفورمين بس من 7 لغايه 10 في ثلاثة أرم، الأرم الأولاني أورال مع الإكزيناتايد، الأرم الثاني أورال مع جلارجين أو لانتوس، الأرم الثالث أورال مع سيليكوا. يبقى دي الثلاثة أرم. الأرم اللي على السيليكوا واضح إن هو فيه آدي بتاع السيليكوا مور ريدكشن في الـ A1C. مور ريدكشن أوف A1C. أكتر من اللي على اللانتوس بس أكتر كمان من اللي على الإكزيناتايد ألون غير الـ A1C كمان الـ Weight الـ Weight Reduction اللي على السيليكوا حصل فيه Significant Weight Reduction اللي على السيليكوا الإكزيناتايد لوحده يعني ما هواش واضح قوي طبعا مع الجلارجين في زيادة في الويت كمان الريسك اوف هايبوجلايسيمي اقل في السيليكوا يبقى ده العيانين اللي هم اخدوا سيليكوا حصل مور ريدكشن اوف ذا اي 1 سي مش على حساب الهايبوجلايسيميا ولا على حساب الويت قلت الهايبوجلايسيميا وقل كمان الويت وزي ما قلت ليه؟ لأنه هنا الجيل بي 1 اللي موجود أو الإكزيناتايد اللي موجود سمارت موليكيول بيشتغل إن أجلوكوز ديبندنت مانر. طيب هنا الستادي الثانية على إفكاسي أند سيفتي أوف برضو سيليكوا تايب 3 أفكسد ريشيو كومباينيشن أوف كلارجين اللي هو السيليكوا ادي العيانين الاولين داتا اون ستادي برضو دبل بلايند اوبن ليبل مالتي سنتريك والفتره بتاعتها يمكن 30 اسبوع ده جلورجين مع ميتفورمين وده سيليكوا مع ميتفورمين عيانين برضو تايب 2 نوت كنترولد على بيزل انسولين شلت البيزل وحطيت سيليكوا سيليكوا كومباينيشن اوف ذا بيزل مع شورت اكتنج جي ال بي 1 اجونيست مع السيليكوا حصل مور ريدكشن اوف اي 1 سي اكتر من الجلارجين حصل برضو سيجنيفيكانت ريدكشن بالنسبه للويت وقل برضو الانسيدنس اوف هايبوجلايسيميا ده انذر ستادي سويتشنج الى السيليكوا عينين على برضو أورال ومعاهم جي ال بي 1 أجونست أنذر جي ال بي 1 سواء كان ديلي زي اللوراجليتايد الفيكتوزا أو ويكلي زي اللوراجليتايد اللي هو كان تروليستي آدي عينين آدي لوراجليتايد أو ممكن إكزانيتايد أو دولاجليتايد إكزانيتايد مرتين دولاجليتايد وانس ويكلي آدي عيانين نوع العيانين اللي موجودين عيانين كان ماشيين على أورال ما اتظبطش على أورال اتحط جي ال بي 1 
فيرسس سيليكوا يبقى في الاول قارنت سيليكوا فيرسس بيزال انسولين ثاني واحده سيليكوا فيرسس جي ال بي 1 ومحطوط الاند بوينت اللي هي بتاع اي حاجه برايمري اند بوينت ريدكشن اوف ذا اي 1 سي عدد العيانين اللي وصلوا للجول الفاستنج والبوست برانديال وبعدين سيفتي ايشو از ريجارد الهايبوجلايسيميا اند الويت جين البيشن كاركترستيك الاثنين زي بعض اللي اخدوا السيليكوا زي اللي اخدوا جي انذر جي ال بي 1 از ريجارد ذا ايج ذا سكس ذا بي ام اي ذا ديوريشن اوف ديابيتس ده الارم بتاع السيليكوا وده الارم بتاع اذر جي ال بي 1 نفس عدد العيانين زي بعض نفس العيانين هنا دول جليتايد او اكزانيتايد او قلب جليتايد او لورا جليتايد كل ال جي ال بي 1 سواء كان لورا جليتايد قلنا وانس ديلي اكزانيتايد تويس ديلي دول جليتايد ده وانس ويكلي ده اللي موجودين Siliqua is done more reduction of the A1C versus other GLP-1. More reduction. وحتى العينين عدد العينين اللي وصلوا للتارجت أكتر مع السليقوة. Without the commented hypoglycemia. Lastly. Mr. Chairman, dear colleague, my take-home message. Therapeutic inertia has been shown to be present في كل مراحل الانتنسفكيشن of treatment. وكل ده القصة انت خايف من الهايبوجلايسيميا خايف من الويت جين ADACD لازم تشوف New algorithm for management of the patient with type 2. Siliqua is a combination of basal insulin plus short-acting GLP-1. It then more reduction of A1C versus basal insulin alone and versus other GLP-1 without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia or the weight. With lower incidence of gastrointestinal adverse event, like the short acting. The study that was done, so an L or G compared basal insulin versus silica, as I demonstrated previously, in the silica give more reduction of A1C without risk of hypoglycemia. And with beneficial effect on the weight. And lastly, I thank you for your attention. Turhala. ده سؤال دكتور طلعت حضرتك سامعني؟ ايوه ايوه بيسمع حضرتك هو السؤال كده ايوه بيسمع حضرتك حضرتك سمعت السؤال ولا اقوله تاني؟ لا ما سمعتش حاجه حضرتك كنت فاصلين خالص اه والله طيب 
هو في هو في سؤال جاي في الـ في الـ يعني السيشن بتاع الدايبيتس عموما يعني آه. آه مش على السوليكو بالذات بيقول على الاس جي ال تي تون هيبيتور بتقول دكتوره صباح عيسى از ذير اني فيوتشر ستاديز فور اس جي ال تي 2 انهيبيتور ان تايب 1 دايبيتس بص يا بي تيل ناو ات از نوت انديكيتد تمام بس انا كان ليا محاضره قلتها في مؤتمر من المؤتمرات في السعوديه على اليوز اوف اس جي ال 2 ان تايب 1 بس تمام. مش بدال للانسولين هي آه. بنحطها مع الانسولين علشان ثلاث حاجات استفاد من الويت ريدكشن استفاد نعم. من ان انا بقلل الانسدنس اوف هايبوجلايسيميا استفاد نعم. من ان انا بقلل الدوز بتاعه الانسولين هي بس تيل ناو ات از نوت اف دي ابروفد تو بي يوز ان تايب 1 ولو انا اديتها في تايب 1 لازم يبقى اندر كومبليت سوبرفيجن ومع الانسولين تمام <تصفيق> شكرا يبقى ده الرد لحضرتك دكتور صباح احنا الحقيقه اه اوكي احنا كده بنشكر حضرتك دكتور طلعت جدا على المحاضره القيمه دي ويا ريت حضرتك تبقى اتشرفنا بوجود حضرتك على طول باذن الله يعني على ما حضرتك على طول يا بي ان شاء الله دكتور شريف ربنا يخلي حضرتك ربنا يخلي ربنا يخلي حضرتك احنا كده بننهي الويبينار دي وفاضل لنا اخر ويبينار النهارده في في المؤتمر بتاع النهارده اخر ويبينار اللي هو هنقوله في هيبقى فيه محاضرتين هنبتدي في خلال دقيقتين على طول باذن الله خلال دقيقتين ثلاثة عشان نفتح بس الويبينار الجديد شكرا